Welcome back, all you mad dogs, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today's trip takes us to the neon-drenched, crime-riddled streets of Yakuza Zero. We're starting off with Tokyo's Kamurocho District, and right off the bat, you can just tell this is the 80s. Places don't look like this anymore. Even looking at semi-recent pictures from the real-life district this is based on, Kabukicho, this feels so different. A large part of that for me is the lights. Admittedly, I don't get around much, so maybe this style is still in widespread use today in places I just haven't seen. But these types of fixtures with flashing lights in a specific pattern feels very retro. Going back to the real life picture, you can see a lot of light boxes that have panels with text on them. You can find a lot of them in game as well. They're bright and much more attention grabbing than a sign that isn't lit up. But this demands attention. The human eye is drawn to movement, so you can't help but look at it. And, well, the scene as a whole gets a little bit chaotic because of that. I counted at least 18 fixtures with flashing lights. There's definitely more than that that just got lost in the noise. And that's not even counting the static lit up signs. So much detail. So many hand-painted textures. And they all blur together in a cacophony of colors. But there is an overall warmness that ties it together. All the lights combine into a general orange glow. Just this orange tint kind of evokes feelings of nostalgia, despite me being nowhere close to anything like this as a kid. I guess that speaks to the talent of the developers that they're able to evoke that feeling in the first place. I'm nostalgic for a place I never visited myself. Let's focus in. Instead of looking at the big picture, let's look at the small little brush strokes that comprise the whole piece. I guess it is kinda weird to do this as a person that doesn't speak Japanese. Nearly all of these signs are written in a language I don't understand. Like I look at this sign and what do I get out of it? I obviously don't know what it says, but I'm also not given any hints as to what it could say. Other places you can kind of get vibes as to what they're advertising, but this keeps its secrets well. I can study the shapes of the kana and kanji and take in the pretty colors, but that's about it. That's all I can do with all of these. And there's just so many. That one, all the way up there. Has anyone ever looked at that one? Like truly taken notice of it and its blocky characters. Or look at this, my god. There's so many posters covering each other, all vying for your attention. It's like this district is a fractal, where big picture, it's busy and chaotic. But the closer you look, you see it's still just as noisy. Well, the main streets at least. There are parts of Camarocho that aren't all glitz and glamour. Down this spooky side street, you're led into the Camaro shopping area. It's a lot more subdued here. Only a handful of the distracting lights we just looked at light up this darkened alley. There's still kind of an orange tint to this place, but there's a lot more gray. Faded signs and shuttered storefronts convey a sense of seediness. Under the rock of the bustling Camarocho district, vermin crawl in the shadows. The cramp factor plays a large part in that feeling. The buildings being as tall and as tightly packed as they are, it's almost constricting. Let's get some fresh air. West Park is a home to the homeless of Camarocho. The tightly packed streets give way to an open air park that feels welcoming in comparison. No shade to my unhoused brethren, but it is kinda unfortunate that their blue tarped shelters take up so much space in the park. A spot completely dedicated to nature would be a nice change of pace for a place steeped so heavily in consumerism. 
though I do kind of like the vibe of the park as it exists. You come here a couple times during the story, and while they did have one problem with some troublemakers, that seemed outside of the norm. They don't have Yakuza or police busting their chops for simply existing. They just kind of get to live off the land. It could be worse. I think we spent enough time outside. Let's visit some insides. Oh man, they really nailed the cheap convenience store vibe. And there's so much stuff. I wish I could go into first person and get up close and personal with all these items. We do get a good look at some magazines though. Even better, you're actually able to look at some of their covers. Weekly Shonen Magazine. That sounds like a generic ripoff of Shonen Jump. Famicom Tsushin. That's probably a Famitsu ripoff. What do Famitsu covers even look like from back then? Wow, that's like literally the same thing. Look at what I can only assume is the name of the magazine. Characters are the same. I wonder if... Yep, that's an actual Famitsu cover. Turns out Famitsu used to go by Famicom Tsushin. Does that mean... Yep, there's an actual magazine called Weekly Shonen Magazine. Shows my knowledge of Japanese print media. I'm assuming all of these are based on real magazines. That's such a cool detail to add to the world. I bet that really helps for authenticity if you live in Japan and are used to seeing these every time you go in a convenience store. Like I just assumed these were all ripoffs. But no, they're real magazines with real covers from the time period. And it's cool that you get to look at the cover while Kiryu gives you a little summary of the magazine. You get a tiny glimpse into what pop culture was like back then. Video games, gossip, and a whole lot of manga. There are eight magazines dedicated to manga here. I love this little thought from Kiryu. It sure would be something to play Mahjong with someone like the heroes of the Naki no Ryu series someday. Sounds like he's a manga reader. That little bit of flavor text reminds you that he's still got a little bit of a young heart, despite all the troubles in his life. And you wouldn't even know that if you didn't visit this magazine stand. Let's visit the ever-popular Don Quixote. This store is packed. I feel like Kiryu's gonna stumble into something and have boxes fall over, completely covering him. Talking to the clerk, he sells pretty much everything. You can't go very far back in the store, but if you could, I imagine you could find nearly anything you wanted. Who knows how far back it stretches out? If only this guy would get out of the way. Look at this little slideshow on the TVs. Just some nice ambiance. There is more than just stores in Camarocho. You can find plenty of places to entertain yourself, like the bowling alley. I wouldn't say this looks like a retro bowling alley, but every bowling alley looks like a retro bowling alley. They've barely evolved. And they don't need to. The vibes here are top notch. Or the disco. Can't have a game take place in the 80s and not have a disco. It's pretty spacious in here. You have the dance floor, but then you also have some side rooms to chill out for a bit. Do you think these two are having a good time? What about these people? Of course they are, how could you not? The dance floor is a buzz with energy. People are dancing like nobody's watching. This is my favorite dance animation. They're killing it. But what if you wanted a more chill vibe? Some place not as loud. There's a few bars in the Champion District that feel real cozy. Like these are good and out of the way from the hustle and bustle of the places we looked at already. This is where you come if you want to unwind for a bit after work before heading home for the night. Perfect little spot for that. I like that Camarocho has both extremes. The super upbeat discos and nightclubs, as well as the tiny bars with only a few seats. Everyone can find their own little spot here. Mm -hmm. 
and we could keep studying Camarocho until we combed over every polygon. This district is just that dense. But we have another place to be. While I take this taxi, feel free to like the video. Kiryu would want you to like it. You don't want to let him down, do you? Welcome to Osaka's Sotenbori. Say, I feel different. Honestly, Sotenbori doesn't feel a whole lot different than Kamurocho at first glance. Shofukucho Street looks almost identical to Kamurocho's Tenkaichi Street. Past that, though, I think a lot of the individual spots you come across make this district feel a bit more varied. Most of the walkable area in Kamurocho are streets built for cars. You never see them in motion on the streets you can access, but the cars imply that people do drive around here. You don't see very many cars in Sotenbori. In fact, I think the only ones I found are taxis that purely exist for mechanical reasons. It feels like this district was designed for people over cars. Look at the ground here in Kamurocho, and the look at it here in Sotenbori. It's much more human. There's all kinds of walkway designs across the district. I particularly like this pattern in Hoganji Yokocho. It really elevates the status of the buildings around it. Like it would feel a lot more dingy in this alley if it was a plain concrete path instead of this carefully crafted stone path. Even the high traffic Sotenbori Street feels unique. The two-lane walkway makes it distinctive compared to Tenkaichi Street in Kamurocho. Some businesses even have things going on outside of the store, kind of bringing some life to the street itself, rather than keeping all the action secluded away in the buildings. I really wanted to go down this path, but there's an invisible wall. The cool lighting of this area makes it stand out compared to the warm lighting of basically everywhere else. Heading south, we're confronted with perhaps the most iconic part of Sotenbori. The river that splits the district in two, and the bridges that bridge the gap. This is the west park of Sotenbori, in that you're given space from the towering buildings that surround you on the streets everywhere else. To the east and west is just empty space, with a river flowing below. This floor design on the eastern bridge is really nice. You get the feeling that people come here just to hang out, which you can deduce from all the people around here just hanging out. Something that's easy to miss, though, is a little set of stairs leading down away from the bridge. You find yourself on a footpath that reaches all the way to the other bridge. There's nothing really of note down here, but it's one of those areas that calls to me. You're totally isolated on this path, but still perfectly in view of both bridges. I guess this is the best you can get in terms of privacy around here. Further south is Ashitaba Park, and, well, it's not much of a park. There's some trees and a little patch of dirt, but that's about it. Though I guess it is nice kids get a little area to play, and it does open up this spot in the city pretty well. It's not as nice as West Park, but I'll give it a pass. Not much else to say about Sotenbori's exteriors. Let's head inside. Club Sunshine is a cabaret club you can actually run. It's a whole little mini-game managing hostesses and customer happiness, but when you aren't playing it, you can just wander around your tiny little club. It's cozy in here. The almost overwhelming amount of red really sells the scene. I can imagine running my hand across these velvety seats. I bet they're super comfortable, considering they want customers to sit down as long as possible and spend as much money as possible. There's a back room you can enter, and I don't have much to say about it. It's a relatively plain room. You know what? Majima's had a long day. It's time to head home. Majima's apartment is… well, it's an apartment. A tiny little cube of living. He has a blanket and a table with a radio and ashtray. I think this is all humans need to survive. 
At some point during the story, it's revealed that Sotenbori is effectively Majima's prison. And looking at this room, it feels like a prison cell. He may run a super nice club and be really good at his job, but he comes back to this depressing sight every night. It's kind of sad. You know what isn't sad? The arcade! One of the staples of a Yakuza game are the arcades you can visit. There's the usual, like a crane game. But there's also actually real video games to be played here. In Sotenbori, you can play Space Harrier and Outrun. It comes back to authenticity, like I talked about earlier with the magazines. It grounds the game so much that you can legitimately play real arcade games that were popular at the time. That's Sega's deep wallet of IPs at work, letting the Yakuza devs just throw in whatever was appropriate for the time. And I'd be saying that even if this was just a static prop that you couldn't interact with, but you can actually play these machines. I don't want that to go underappreciated. It's such a cool little diversion to be able to come in here and blow off some steam playing an arcade classic. Alright, my favorite spot in the game. Do you know where I'm going? I wonder if any of you are getting to know me too well through these videos. We're back in the distracting and busy streets of Camarocho. But we're burrowing deep within the city to find a place not many citizens have likely come across. A place so seemingly inconsequential, there'd be no reason to give it a second glance. Looks can be deceiving, though. The Empty Lot this tiny, unassuming patch of land is the driving force behind the plot of the game. Everything that happens in the story is because of this. Every lot around this place has been bought up by the Yakuza, but this is the only lot they have yet to purchase, and they need it. The profits from the businesses they'll build here will bring in billions, and they already have so much property in the surrounding area, but they need this empty lot. Having beaten the game and gone through everything because of this lot, it's bizarre to return here. Like, really? This is why everyone was at each other's throats? Just a patch of dirt and some trash? Though it's obviously more than that. It's the right to develop this property for the purposes of profit. It's a gift to gain favor with higher-ups. It's a pawn in a game we can't even begin to comprehend. It's bizarre to think that such a seemingly benign piece of land, hidden away in the depths of a bustling city, can play such a big role in so many people's lives. Check out either of these videos if you're interested in more pretzel goodness. Maybe even throw me a couple of bucks on Patreon, that'd be kinda cool of you. Or don't, that's cool too. Thanks for watching and see you next time.